those who don't know, the Free State Project is a movement of voluntary human action where we are trying to concentrate libertarians in the state of New Hampshire. I think we've got done uh, more in the last decade than every other libertarian movement combined has accomplished in the last five decades. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, libertarians and anarchists, movers, natives, and those on your way, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Free State Live, where you can hear about all the different ways you can live free and thrive in the free state of New Hampshire. First and foremost, welcome back our casting crew. My name is Justin O'Donnell. As always, I'm a former libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate, author, and host of the Subversive Podcast, and we have the two tallest free staters in New Hampshire. First, our family man and keyboard, keyboard warrior extraordinaire, Kevin from the internet. How's it going, Kevin? Good, good, good. Another exciting episode. As always, and back after a short absence, we have our favorite meme maker and local stand-up comedian, New Hampshire native, Bill Barger. How's it going, Bill? Bill muted himself. You're again. muted, Bill. Oh, it's going cool. good. It's a fun topic today if I can get my act together. Actually, <laughs> I don't have to get my act together. Luckily, we have we have good people here. Yeah. yeah. Like that. Well, that's right. It is a fun topic. I mean, bill review season's right around the corner. We already talked to NHLA about getting everyone ready for that. Elections are in the rearview mirror, uh, and the whole activist community here in New Hampshire is kind of in this in-between limbo stage. Everyone's changing gears and uh, resting from campaigns and getting ready to pivot towards the legislative activism for the next year. And um, it's always important to highlight the organizations that are taking charge of some of the more controversial issues in the bills coming up each year. And so joining us tonight to talk about Americans for Prosperity and their role in the fight for freedom in New Hampshire, we got Ross Conley. Ross, thanks for joining us tonight. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah. It's been a long time in the uh, works. I mean, I, I've been meaning to ask you to come on the show for, um, I don't know, months at this point and just didn't get around to it. Kept get, losing track of things myself. But luckily, we connected a few weeks ago and uh, able to make it happen. Um, now, you're working with Americans for Prosperity, and a lot of people don't think of Americans for Prosperity as a local kind of a group. Everything else here in New Hampshire with what we do with the Free State Project is very, very localized and like either home-brewed, home-born, or homegrown groups of local activists. But when people think of Americans for Prosperity, they think of this big behemoth of a national network of a group. Uh, but AFP New Hampshire really does take those resources and focus them really locally and i mean what is afp new hampshire's role in the new hampshire activist community i mean really well first off for uh afp at large i mean we exist to to remove barriers within the institution of government so that uh you know everybody can realize their full, full potential have equal opportunities to succeed and uh you know here in new hampshire we're a small team everyone thinks we're like this giant organization <laughs> there's just four of us right now where we're hiring a fifth, but um, you know we're a small, lean team uh, that focuses on really connecting with with we we sort of live by the Frederick Douglass quote. If you've heard it, work with anybody to do good, nobody to do evil. Uh, so we'll work with anyone uh, to really empower them, whether it's at the local level, state level, or federal level, uh, to make a difference in in removing those those barriers in government that are holding people back. And I, I almost feel like that's the sole role of government sometimes when you look at it and its abstract national views to hold people back. I mean, every law you can think of, I feel like you could just put up, if you put all the laws on a dartboard and threw one at random, you'd find it's a restriction, not anything that empowers somebody. Yeah, <laughs> I think that, that we spent a fair amount of time, you know, fighting bad things that, that yeah. are coming in through the federal government. Certainly there's no no shortage of bad things that are happening at the federal level. Uh, but even at the state level, you know, I expect a fair amount of it uh, this year where it's such close margins. You know, there's there's a chance that a bad thing could slip through. So, you know, we need to make sure that government isn't growing, uh, that government's uh, actually uh, you know, reducing its its influence in, in people's lives and making, you know, getting out of the way so that people uh, can actually actually succeed and, and just do what they're passionate about. Now, with the margins being so close in the state house this year, I think we're, we're at what, a 201 to 198 majority with a vacant seat um, for the Republicans. Like, does that open any 
as any doors well it does close them because i know it's, it's not going to be as easy to just get a majority through with the liberty caucus anymore but does it open maybe some other doors for collaboration with people on the left on some other issues that might have been overlooked in the past few sessions where it was a much larger republican majority we think so i i mean we we think you know with close margins in the house you, you get to find common ground with both both sides so uh you know really focusing on some of the criminal justice issues things like occupational licensure should get you know more cross-party support uh and we've improved numbers in, in the senate there's uh more liberty leaning you know senators that that can sort of influence the caucus in in the senate uh so hopefully we can get some accomplished you know some good things accomplished whether it's in forfeiture or or um you know some other criminal justice uh, bills that that are coming up are there any main priorities on the plate like things that you guys have had like sitting kind of in the shoot ready to go in line ready to go that are have been submitted this year have reps behind them that are priorities to focus on from a lobbying standpoint and from an activist standpoint yeah, I mean, obviously, we thought the election might might be go a little differently. So we had a lot of things teed up that that we we've been working on for a while, things like right to work. But that's just going to be, you know, very difficult to accomplish this this year. So we've we've shifted a little bit in, in some of our, our prioritization um, where the, the top things will be really defending the good things we've done over the past few years. So making sure that uh, education freedom accounts don't get rolled back, making sure that tax increases die where they're supposed to, um, and, and really defending those, those priorities. But beyond that, you know, we see opportunity, like I said, uh, we currently have a two track system in forfeiture. We ban civil, yeah. civil asset forfeiture. However, uh, right now, if you uh, go to court, go to criminal court, you get acquitted for, for a crime, you had had assets uh, taken from you uh, through through uh, seizure and forfeiture, that right now you have to go to civil court after the criminal court process. Most just people don't even do that. Back. You default. Uh, you know, yeah. it's just not worth the spending the money to, to go and get a hundred bucks when it costs a thousand bucks for for a lawyer. So, uh, you know, our idea is to, to end that process, uh, put it all within criminal court. If, if you're acquitted, you should get your assets back. And that's something that we think we, we can get, you know, both Democrat support, Republican support, hopefully in, in both chambers. Yeah. And I had an unfortunate experience uh, myself with similar issue where when I lived in Massachusetts, I'd run into an issue that led to some property being taken into the custody of the state police. And even though no charges ended up ever being filed, they dismissed everything. I talked to the two local police chiefs in the towns where it was happened. And they said, yeah, we're not prosecuting. We have, we understand what happened and it wasn't in anybody's control. It was a fluke accident. We're not doing anything. Um, when the state police refused to give me my pro firearms back, I'd contacted a lawyer and the lawyer took an inventory. He's like, it'll be cheaper for you to move to New Hampshire and buy new ones than to ever get them back. Yeah. So, so it sounds about right. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think, um, you know, it, it, and it goes towards, like I said, assets, whether it's, it's cars, guns, yep. uh, houses, even, uh, you know, but mostly it's, it's the small monetary things. You also don't get re representation in, in civil court. So, you know, if it's in criminal court, you at least get a, a, a lawyer that's appointed to you. So, you know, we think it'll it'll result in fewer defaults and uh, actually protecting people's property rights opposed to the current system. Hopefully. Uh, now, Dennis Pratt asked a question in the chat. Yeah, he wants to know uh, if you can describe a time when we have partnered with the left successfully. Uh, I know this is something a lot of people doubt. A lot of people doubt that the left and progressives are actually willing to work with us. Maybe not the other way around. We we always make it known we're willing to work with anyone to do good from a libertarian standpoint because we're used to being in the middle and being the true minority. Uh, but has there been a time when it's been successful? I mean, off my off the top of my head, I can think of the needle exchanges and the decrim effort and stuff in the past like that but are there any other maybe ones that weren't as big of a deal or highly publicized sure i i think uh, going back to the previous topic is yep. banning civil asset forfeiture that right. was a cross-party uh vote we we got support from both parties uh in order to do that uh we uh 
successfully uh, got rid of the licensure requirement for hair braiders uh, that back in, <laughs> I think that was 2018. And, uh, you know, that was, again, cross-party support. That was back when the left sort of also supported <laughs> occupational licensure reform. Unfortunately, they've sort of rolled that back now. But um, there- Somebody cut know, a check. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, I, I think Trump supported it, so everyone had to abandon the issue yeah. on the left. But um, you know, there's there's common ground when even when it comes to some of the property rights bills, allowing people to build more, removing regulations. There, there, there is a lot of support for that across both parties, uh, and obviously, things like cannabis legalization uh, changes the cannabis laws, where uh, I think decrim was was cross-party support so there's plenty of examples you know i work with folks from the aclu uh, frequently whether it's on transparency laws so changes to 991a uh being able to better access government records uh and and things like um uh oh well one one example is bail reform that that's a bit of a controversial <laughs> one but that was something that we supported and worked with then Senator Feltis, who was a Democrat. Yeah, I, I, I was yeah. going to mention checkpoints, too, when you mentioned ACLU, because mm -hmm. I remember a few years back, I ended up getting detained at a Border Patrol checkpoint up in Woodstock on my way to Porkfest. Uh, and it ended up being a nightmare. I live streamed the whole thing, and I was not the most polite to the Border Patrol agents during my time. Um, but the next day, uh, G. Bissonnette and some staffers from the ACLU showed up at Porkfest with a bunch of lit for Porkfest libertarians about how to deal with border checkpoints. Yeah, and that's one that uh, Kevin Craig sponsored the bill when when he was at in the House. So you had the ACLU, uh, us, and and a bunch of other groups uh, from all sides, you know, trying to get that done. I, I don't think it made it, but it, you know, it, I always think there's value in starting a conversation in the State House. So eventually, it will get do, will get passed. Do you do you think we'll get so back I, to somewhere where you see? Oh, sorry, Bill. Where you see? <laughs> no, like, go ahead. Um, some some sort of like cross party stuff on the upcoming like session and the bills that have been proposed. Is, do you think we'll see more crossover? Um, you know, I I think so because it's the, bad, but it's the only way they could possibly get something you know things done. That's, yeah, um, that's what I was wondering. You know, when it's a you know four vote margin or whatever it is, you know, after the tie gets disputed, it'll be even closer. So if you're going to get anything done over the next two years, they have to find some common ground to work work on things. So um, things like I, I've seen a lot of it. Qualified immunity reform uh, has has people from both parties sponsoring it. Um, uh, Cannabis, I mentioned, uh, like similar. So. Qualified immunity feels like that one might be weird because it's kind of establishment Democrat and progressive platform piece, but it's the Liberty Republicans, not the rest of the party that want to support it. Uh, so it's almost like the libertarians and free staters in the House going to the other side to get a good thing done rather than relying on a majority. <laughs> It that's depends that. with that issue. I mean, that yeah. that's one that, um, you know, we, we did have even some more like conservatarians and conservatives supporting that because of the the second amendment issue so uh you know that getting rid of qualified immunity allows you to then sue in civil, yep. civil court if your second amendment violation is or second amendment rights have been violated so slight slight left turn um i don't know if you guys saw this i'm sure some of you did the DNC, I believe it was, just voted to move the first in the nation primary to South Carolina. <laughs> Do you think that'll affect like the Democrat Party going forward and the, what they're willing to work on or any of that? Is that, is that going to make a difference here for an organization like AFP? I don't think so. Just all optics. No, it's there. I mean, from what I've seen, that's they're still going to be first. It's just what penalty the DNC gives them uh we do have a state law that makes new hampshire the first in the nation so it's just sort of a moot point it's very entertaining <laughs> it's it's been wildly entertaining to see uh, new hampshire's congressional delegation speaking up against the dnc because yeah. how dare you take our tax funded straw poll away yeah. <laughs> uh, but no pivoting back to you you brought up the cannabis bills and that seems to be um the big one 
every session because it, it always passes the house. No problem. What some version or variant of a cannabis bill will pass the house seemingly every year. And then it dies in the Senate. Um, but that's passed with majorities and like super majorities. Now that the house is so contentious, do you think, is that going to make it harder to pass a cannabis bill or will the introduction of new liberty leaning legislators into the Senate make it easier to finally get it all the way through? Uh, no, to, to your first question, no. Uh, ev every single uh, cannabis bill that, you, no matter what it is, even the state liquor store, you know, having state <laughs> cannabis stores last year was that. That, by the way, was the only bill we we didn't support, um, <laughs> just because it grew government and it was uh, bad in concept. But even that passed the House. It was in a slimmer majority, but it still passed. Every single one of them will pass the House. the The, the question is the Senate. Um, and to your point, we we've in, you know increased our numbers of, of supporters within the Senate. Um, it's it's a much narrower uh, margin. So uh, we hope with the model that our coalition has come up with, we we really think that we can make a, a good run of it. Obviously, we need the the governor to at least not oppose the bill. Uh, right. if he supported it, uh, we would very much appreciate that, but, <laughs> um, you know, just not opposing it and, and letting people finally take care of this issue, uh, is our goal and getting the biggest, uh, you know, vote total that we can in the house is, is super important. That's why we have, uh, both the majority leader, Jason Osborne and the minority leader, Matt Wilhelm are both, uh, sponsors of the bill. No, I, I just Kevin brought up. Uh, we were talking before the show when he looked. There are currently fourteen LSRs and bills submitted um, of varying stripes uh, to legalize cannabis in the state this year, and it's a controversial topic even amongst libertarians. I, I feel like it's not controversial at all against the progressive left. Like legalize, tax, and regulate, done deal, and they don't care how it gets done as long as it gets done. But with libertarians, a lot of times I've seen them like be, let the perfect become the enemy of the good. In yeah. a lot of cases, um, where it's I've seen libertarians line up to oppose a legalized tax and regulate bill because it had any taxes at all, uh, and then would kill a bill if somebody uh, wouldn't accept their amendment to treat it like a tomato uh, grown in the backyard. Um, so there's like a lot of debate here. What is your in like maybe AFP's perfect bill? Um, and maybe two different kinds of perfect bill. What do you think the perfect? bill that should be passed versus the perfect bill that could be passed right what could be done <laughs> i mean i personally i would love to see no taxes you know just right. treated like any other product but that's just unfortunately not reality um you know one one bill we've supported year over year has been carol mcguire's uh bill that legalizes without retail so it legalizes without taxes it allows you to grow at home um, and, and, uh, you can transport it and you can gift it. Um, the Senate absolutely detests the idea of home grow. So, um, you know, they, they consistently have voted down things like just allowing medical patients to grow at home. Uh, so we have three principles at AFP that re we really want to see included in any bill, making sure that the consumer is protected. So having, you know, testing of the product, uh, making sure that it, it, it's the it hands of minors and uh, making sure that the, the taxes and barriers to entry into the industry are as low as humanly possible. Because everyone always talks about just the tax portion and how if you increase the taxes too much, then you're not going to block block out any black market or you're not actually going to lower the price and make it more affordable for the consumer. The the other portion of that is if you over-regulate the thing, it, the whole system is going to be a disaster. We've seen right. this, you know, in, in Massachusetts, you know, had a lot of cronyism within their their rollout. It's just at the point where the, the price is dropping. I think it's the only thing getting cheaper right now. But, <laughs> um, you know, we those are the things that we w really look for. Uh, we also want to see wiping of records. If, if you were, yep. you know, if we're legalizing it, we should, we should make good on anyone that we punished for it, uh, you know, in the past.
Yeah. Well, I mean, would there be an issue? And I've uh, just thinking of this now, because I know New Hampshire has a constitutional prohibition on retrospective laws on doing anything that affects anything in the past or uh, does anything or changes the definitions of anything in the past. Everything must be from there forward. Could you do something like wiping all past records for something that was illegal at the time? Uh, Or would it just be on Palm Passage, we very much encourage the governor to pardon everyone. Um, so th- one thing, the governor of New Hampshire can't do pardons on his own. He, he yeah. has to have the, the executive <clears throat> council, but you can do annulment. So you, you can just uh, wipe records. The tricky thing here is, you know, we bundle a lot of records. So uh, if, if you were charged with possession and like five other things, it's difficult to separate those because we we would only be annulling uh, you know, cannabis possession charges. So uh, we want to make it in our bill, it's automatic uh, for those more complicated uh, uh, cases, then you can you can petition to have it annulled with no fee. So we want to make sure they're not charging okay. them a fee. And it's simple as possible, you know, having it be as automatic as, as possible is, is the main goal. So what is the bill that Sununu or you think would functionally get passed in New Hampshire regarding marijuana legislation um, as opposed to like the AFP version or a free state or a libertarian or liber- liberal Democrat Republic. What is the thing that actually makes it best? Because the one big question that I'm asked from a lot of people from out of state or that are visiting is like, what's up with the marijuana laws, you know, and without any knowledge or information of what they even currently are in New Hampshire, they just see like, Oh, it's a big no go over there. Whereas every other state around you guys, and you hear the same kind of, you know, lines over and over again, what's the thing that tips it over or would convince, um, you know, that once it goes through the Senate or gets to Sununu's desk, like what's the thing that makes it pass versus not pass in New Hampshire? I mean, this has been the question, you know, for, for 10, 15 years, however long it's been. Is It's it's not that, uh, you know, if cannabis will be legal in New Hampshire, it's how, you know, right, it, right. It, everyone knows, like, it, it's going to happen. I think the governor knows at this point it, it has to happen. We're <laughs> surrounded. Yep. We're, ex- we're, we're making people violate federal law uh, by going into Massachusetts, Vermont or, or Maine to purchase it and bring it over state lines. Anyone that's consuming cannabis or wants to is already doing that. You know, most people live within 30 minutes of that of a, of a retail store. It's just in another state. So everyone realizes that we think that this bill this year, uh, sponsored by uh, Majority Leader Osborne, is the best solution. You know, we really tried to get everybody's input from across the spectrum. Uh, So we have the ACLU in New Hampshire, New Hampshire Cannabis Association, the Alternative Treatment Centers. We took feedback from New Futures, who used to be vehemently opposed and now is supportive, you know, with with some contingencies. So we tried to address as much as that as, as possible. So we have you know, really took lessons from, from other states. Maine has great licensing laws, yep. for instance, super low. So we, we sort of based uh, the tiers of, of getting a license to open a store off them. So it only costs a few hundred bucks uh, to, to actually open a store. Anyone can do it. Um, and, and the regulations are really centered around cultivators and manufacturers of products. Um, with that, we have an eight and a half percent tax uh, it's not a new tax. It's an expansion of the meals and rooms tax. So it will be the meals, rooms, and cannabis tax. Uh, that really gets around. We're, we're not creating any any new new tax that a lot of Republicans are concerned about. And then 70% of any money that's, that's raised uh, or taken, <laughs> whichever way you want to look at it, uh, is then uh, 70% of it goes to paying off the pension liability and property taxes. Property tax is the big one. That's yeah. one we all want to see reduced. And I, I was going to bring up, um, I, I know I make this argument to people all the time when they complain about how we have a state monopoly on liquor uh, with the liquor stores, where I, I, the state liquor stores 
account for a not insignificant portion of New Hampshire's total revenue just from out-of-state purchasers crossing the border to buy cheaper liquor from Maine and Massachusetts. But on the flip side, how much are we now losing that in-state consumers of cannabis have spent the past decade going to Massachusetts to purchase their cannabis. Uh, and it does that, has that offset basically any gain that the liquor stores have given the state. It's, it's hard to tell. I mean, yeah. with, with any of the like cross border sales, right. like we MPP marijuana policy project project estimates that we'd have like a hundred million dollars raised it, that's probably low. Um, you know, I think it would be higher just because we would have it, eight and a half percent would be by far the lowest in the country tax rate. Uh, you know, Massachusetts effectively is 20, most of them are like 30 percent. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we would be undercutting everyone by a huge margin. Uh, and again, having it so uh, there's no restrictions on the amount of stores. Uh, towns actually have to vote. To, to not allow a, a store opposed to Massachusetts where you vote to actually allow it. Um, so a lot of the principles in this bill al allow for us to just out compete the neighbors. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm from New Hampshire. I, yeah. I, I thought it's, it's ridiculous my whole life that this is, you know, most of my life, it was enormously prohib prohibitive. You, you could get a felony for it. And, uh, you know, now I want to see New Hampshire be the absolute best model in the country for, for cannabis legalization. Well, I, I think it's a great push. I think uh, I'm looking forward to it again. Maybe we, I think we might have an opportunity to like this be the binding issue that forces people to build bridges on other things. And that was this year with as contentious as the majority minority split is that having this kind of a common ground issue can maybe force things to calm down and actually be effective for once um but how can people get involved and help out like because this is an issue that a lot of people care about not not even just cannabis the other issues being pushed um like how, how can people keep up with what AF afp is doing any need for volunteers i know you guys do phone banks throughout the legislative season trying to make sure legislators can get to work on the scheduled day because attendance matters when the majority is so close um like where can people get more information and get more involved yeah, you can visit americansforprosperity.org, sign up on our, our, our mailing list. Uh, you can go to the Action Center there uh, and actually take direct action on bills, encourage your legislator to, to make changes uh, and, and, and vote on certain bills. You know, you can pick and choose based on the issue. We engage in a lot of issues, so uh, definitely visit there. Uh, visiting New Hampshire Cannabis Association as well. I think they're nhcan.org. Um, you know, they'll have a lot of updates, uh, and, and just, uh, my emails are Connolly at afphq.org. You can always shoot me a message if you want an update of what's going on. Uh, but we'll, we'll be super active on this issue and a ton of others. Uh, there will be no, no dull moments over the next <laughs> two years in the New Hampshire legislature. So we need people involved, especially on the cannabis issue. It's something that's been missing year over year. Everyone sees the polls, you know, 70, 80 percent of people approve of this. Uh, they do not see that in the state house. People need to show up, go to the right. hearings, you know, make your voice heard on this if you actually want to see it happen. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to Like I said, thank you so much for coming on tonight and telling us in about what's going on. And remember, everybody watching, if you want to learn more about what we're doing, you can check out fsp.org, learn more about the Free State Project. And as always, great tools on the website to help you plan your visit if you're not here yet. Best way to make your decision is on a visit. Come and check it out. Um, also, the calendar. If you're here in New Hampshire, if you're not connected to your local liberty community, if you want to get involved and see what uh, you can do to get involved locally, whether it's social events or activism events and protests and other stuff like that, the calendar on FSP.org is the most jam-packed liberty calendar in the world. You'll never run out of things to do, and you'll never be able to do them all, but you're going to burn yourself out trying if you do. So <laughs> find the things that interest you in your areas and great way to meet your community and if you want to support the programs that we do at fsp.org slash give where you can set up a contribution and remember the free state project is a 501c3 charitable nonprofit organization that specifically cannot and does not endorse legislation candidates everything discussed here is for informational purposes but if you do want to make a contribution that is a tax deductible contribution don't let uncle sam waste your money <laughs> and, and bill kevin you guys got anything you want to leave off on 
join the Discord because that's just crazy. what I always say. Oh uh, yeah, I never remember to come visit the Discord for. <laughs> yeah, definitely come visit. We still have a lot right. going on, even Liberty though it's Forum getting cold. In, uh, the reform in March. March tickets. Be announcing speakers Center. and stuff very soon. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, well, thank you again, Ross, for coming on. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Make sure you give it a like, hit that subscribe button, and share with your friends. Until next time, be free. Yeah, I don't believe in destiny. I just do what's best for me. Don't listen to my enemies. Just full of jealousy, yeah, this legacy You gon' see what's left of me You gon' see success in me You ain't seen the rest I of just me. wanna be the best at what I know Better than the rest, just watch me grow Put me to the test and watch me go This is my quest, I'ma make it known They call me obsessive, oh I know Call me selective with my notes Call me aggressive with my flow Call me offensive even though Joey ain't gonna lie